title of this presentation is The South in Poetry, Landscapes, History, Characters. The South is a treasury of historical figures, events, and incidents, landscapes and waterscapes that invite reflective treatment in verse. Such verse stirs the moral imagination, reminding us of natural beauty and human failure, goodness, and striving. Countless poems of mine are set in the South. I shall read 10 poems from my collections. I've published 10 books so far, all with presses in the South, and my 11th is coming out on the 2nd of October from Mercer University of Press uh, under the title uh, A Memory of Manas. So I shall start here with the shortest of the poems. This is on, on Mobile Bay. And I think we have some people from Alabama here. This is in free verse, very short. As I said, one could see pelicans at morning, trimming the water's edge and smoothing out the sleep from my face with their sostenuto flight. A flock of six or seven once, then a dozen, dipping down along a seam of algae and the buck buckling waves. The more intense for taking up so little sky, they gathered thinking into stillness, and nothing else was needful in that plenitude. The fishing birds threaded on the wind, white ribbons on the breakers, and the sun above the water's rim, an ornament on the broad blue of mind. Oh, please. Please hold your afterwards big, big bash, if you wish. <laughs> uh, that, that came up from, from a, a collection of mine. I didn't bring the book because there's just one poem from it. It's called Passages, LSU Press, 1996. And, now, and I've got some others from uh, Under the Pergola, LSU Press, uh, 2011. Uh, so uh, the next is Great Egret Feeding. This poem, like lots of mine, is, is in formal verse. It's a rhyme quatrains uh, of, uh, of uh, iambic pentameters. Great egret feeding. In shallows near the bayou's edge he feeds, beyond the new bridge and the rippling bite, attending to the keenest of his needs, the daily tyranny of appetite. The middle current's motion is too quick for wading. Thus he leans with neck and beak from the periphery, a politic solution with appropriate physique. Detecting movement in the glaucous flow, he dips his head, a dagger's thrust, to seize his prey and swiftly swallow it. Below, the waters hide an absence. Proving ease, he straightens, tucks his chin, resumes a stance of patience. Now he steps upstream by strides aristocratic in their elegance, then, taking to the air, flies off and glides a dozen yards before alighting, wings spread wide for breaking, graceful fans. A palm dispenses from its grove fresh whisperings. These plumed shivers are the soul of calm. Same collection, Cypress Needs. It was written after a visit down to the bayou and a little, a little boat trip on the bayou. We saw alligators and that, but this is not about alligators. Cypress Needs. Mutants rooted in their wet and nether world where friends and I are boating, a waterscape of dead and living cypress hung with Spanish moss. The rigid and immobile knees resemble amputated limbs returned to life or the debris of war, rotten, mutilated members scattered in the rain and blood-soaked fields that lined the sum in the Great War, or bits of bodies blown apart in Vietnam. 
or are they offshoots of some, some ancient race emerging from the primal slime or dwarves who whisper gnomic words above the dark and still morass, then coaxing, draw imagination down to capture it? Perhaps they're nymphs, young Alcyons not yet formed. I wonder if it's they, those sighs and rustlings among the shadows, tender voices prophesying as before out of the mouths of earth. The water, barely moving, is my dream, transparent darkly, mirror or glassy passage to the depths. We drift along the fragile metal skiff enmeshed in leaves and seed pods like Ophelia's hair. Possessed, the mind descends toward Lethe and the shades. I might, immortal, wish to die here among men, decay in sweetness, feel familiar limbs reviving with my vestiges, the grain released, new roots admired, gathering the sun by green appendages, which breathe the moist, well-salted air and give their undulations to the wind. The engine starts again. Our murky selves begin to flow emerging from the tree's embrace into the bayou, rippled in the light. A blue desire of, young, of lungs inhabits me, the alveoli filling with the breeze, aspiring, free. This poem is called False River. It will be in my forthcoming collection out in October. A False River is the name of a big oxbow of the Mississippi River, a big loop where the Mississippi went around in a big letter C and then decided to take the shortcut. Uh, it is near the towns of Pointe Coupe or Pointe Coupe and New Roads. There's the mention here of Mesa Bay, the Indian uh, and French word for the Mississippi River. I'm going to write. This poem is dedicated to my friend Olivia Pass, with whom I'm working on a book, and to my husband Patrick who is in Houston in a nursing home, but a whole lot better than he was. He can't be here. Uh, I, I say that because they are mentioned in the poem. False River. It's wide, impressive, but it's false. Really an oxbow lake formed when the Mississippi, on its own, changed its course 300 years ago or so, chopping off a loop leaving to the west of Pointe Coupe, an island and a flowing sea. Farther north a bit, there's Old River, too, another oxbow designed by Captain Shreve, a shortcut practical for shipping. Then at its other end, three rivers, a third detour and a canal linking the great Mesa Bay to the Red and the Atchafalaya. A pirogue could get lost here, drifting, ghostly, trapped by river fogs, trees, brambles, old shacks, derelicts. In contrast, we arrive sanely by way of St. Francisville, crossing the river on the Audubon Bridge to new roads, Le Chemin Neuf. Listed buildings draw the eye, a former bank restored, an old store, the courthouse, Romanesque revival, and Le Jeune Plantation. Oh, and there's St. Mary's Church, a red brick Gothic beauty. The very landscapes old and venerable. Spanish moss, of course, ancient azaleas, bald cypress, and 60 parish trees on the live oak registry, with monumental sculpted trunks and limbs that graze the ground. But we've no time now for touring. I've got to speak to the Historical Society in their museum, likewise historical. There's chattering among the crowd, black and white, partly in the local Creole, maintained by families named Bergeron, Dupre, Le Beau, Provosti. I am welcomed warmly. 
Aren't we all the children of the beautiful French tongue? Afterwards, Olivia, Pat, and I go off for seafood to Morel's, built right on the Oxbow, flanked by camps and docks. Across the water, lights beam or wink their messages. Old street lamps guide our steps along the gallery, then after dinner, show us to the bridge. Why, we ask ourselves next day over coffee, drive home via Baton Rouge, the reasonable route. Let's try back roads, past cattle pastures, fallow fields, the ripening sugar cane, and bayous edged with waxy myrtle and red oak. Lovely, but a labyrinth. We wander. One town we hit twice. I recognize Livonia, where once I ate at Joe's Dreyfus store, but that doesn't help. I think now of three rivers. Finally, Maranguin, where, lucky as we are, we find the route to Lafayette. We've left, though, something of ourselves behind. The shriving that authenticates paid purchase of experience. Now those were my waterscapes and landscapes for you. And now a city evocation because I can't do a reading without at least one New Orleans poem. So I have chosen for you uh, re um, the Jesus of Magazine Street <laughs> from a collection called Places in Mind, LSU Press 2000. Uh, this is in free verse, as most of those other poems were, but in stanzas of eight, of uh, five stanzas of eight lines. Uh, Magazine Street, some of you know, is a, a, a street that follows the river uh, in New Orleans from from uh, uh, from a Canal Street along the river uptown. Uh, it has lots of shops. It's a varied street. You will find what you want on Magazine Street. I live very close, and in this poem, this poem records by going on an errand. The Jesus of Magazine Street. Because a shop called Shades of Light is closed, here I am in April loitering on the stoop of Jewels, a Palestinian grocery, and listening idly to the Jesus of Magazine Street, while my broken lamp stands on the sidewalk, and even my Jeep is a derelict, having hobbled this way with a deflated tire. Waiting for a man to come round with a jack and the shop to open, I drink coffee with the grocer, who explains that the fellow shouting there, deranged a bit, is not dangerous. Just asks for a cigarette now and then, but unlike Christ at Cana, he appears to leave wine alone, which is doubtless a fortunate thing, and preaches to all who pass by. I am the Jesus of Magazine Street. Repent, repent. When the last trumpet sounds, oh yes, I'll be up there. White man, where will you be? The grocer observes to me, tapping his own, that a fuse has blown in the fellow's head, but that he cannot blame him, thanking God instead that he himself is rational. Perhaps he thinks of Palestine, the Hebron Valley, Galilee, of one who cried repentance in the wild, and its most famous son, who for a while prayed out in the desert with the birds, under the olive trees, and then returned, illumined, cleansed, and filled with holy words, which he distributed like loaves along the roads and by the lake, until he was betrayed, his radiant godliness rewarded by a crucifying mob. Here, at least, the fellow is unharmed, although disciples few. The Easter sunlight shines on shards of glass and the oil-stained shoes of the prophet, walking the road of madness to the deserted mountaintop.
So there were five of the poems for tonight. And now historical evocations. We've got historians here. Everybody here appreciates history, I do believe. Some of these evocations are connected either to, to houses and properties. Uh, house poetry is an honored vein in British literature, Ben Johnson and so on. The five poems I'll read are all set in the 19th century. Four are narrative monologues in blank verse. Blank verse is the thing for a narrative monologue. And three of these are spoken in the first person. In all, pardon me, in all cases, the fundamental historical, sometimes architectural details are accurate. So I will start with Chrétien Point. Where is Chrétien? Ah, here we are. All right, Chrétien Point. It's a house, famous house in Louisiana, St. Landry Parish. Uh, the references are made to the year 1800 Andrew Jackson, and then the Battle of New Orleans. But when the speaker, a woman, was young, but now she speaks from her later years. So this is, this is in blank verse. So people talk, then let them. This house wears its honor quite as well as most along the prairies of Acadia. The land, a Spanish grant, was purchased by a man from France in 1800, later bought by Hippolyte Chrétien. Young Hippolyte, my husband, owned it next, and now it's mine. Félicité, the Spanish Creole wife. He courted me. What is a temper worth? If one embraces sparks, mantilla, eyes of dark St. Elmo's fire, tendrilled hair ungoverned with its Moorish waves, one must expect to burn. Before the war in 1812, Pierre and Jean Lafitte were visitors, it said. Perhaps they dealt in contraband, alive. But in the fight against the British, the Lafittes turned out with Hippolyte and other planters, sailed the bayous, fought with Jackson to defend New Orleans. My Spanish father, too. Against his country's custom, he believed in liberty. Perhaps that's why he chose America and gave me leave to do just as I pleased, or nearly. When we wed, the neighbors waited for the match to blaze. It's true we quarreled, young Hippolyte and I. I smoked, unheard of for a woman drank a bottle by myself, played cards, and won. But any marriage is combustible. We did agree, however, on a house of crimson brick, flamboyant on the green surrounding us all seasons. Cypress blinds, great Tuscan columns, fine entablature, acanthus leaf medallions, heavy walls, a fortress against weather. Mantled hearths composed a truce between us. Four years passed. The house was finished. Shortly, Hippolyte was dead of yellow fever. What he'd got as dowry, stubbornness and metal, saved his legacy. When highwaymen appeared and threatened me, I shot one through the throat. The others fled. I traveled by myself by boat down river, managed my affairs, then harvested new wealth from poker games when men, such fools, believed that they could win against a widow. Rumors fly of treasure here because my Hippolyte did not trust banks. Indeed, his servant stole and buried gold piastre in the garden, but he talked with some persuasion. Fortune turns her wheel. Low sulfured skies, untimely cries of birds. It's Hippolyte I want to see, not God. Companionship with him and with his ghost 
left embers that have warmed me since. It's time to reconcile. Old ash, new flames. We'll walk the rooms of light, and I'll be young again. The next poem is called Shata Yi Ma on Bayou Lacombe. Uh, this is in free verse, uh, uh, six, uh, eight line stanzas of free verse. This poem concerns the character and career of Adrien Rouquet, born in 1813 in New Orleans, an eccentric Creole poet, but what poet might not be a bit eccentric? who wrote in both French and English. Uh, he had, as a youth, he was shipped off to Paris by his family. I should say that he was fascinated with Indians as a boy. And he ran, he would take his uh, canoe. They lived on Bayou Saint-Jean. He would take his canoe, cross Lake Pontchartrain, and go among the Indians. They'd have to go retrieve him. So they shipped him off to Paris by his family. He attended the, Lucie, le, le Lycée Louis Le Grand. I write it too. Then uh, he was shipped off to Paris three times. Uh, he uh, and you'll hear some about that. He later became a priest. He said mass at the uh, cathedral, uh, Saint Louis Cathedral in New Orleans. Then he settled across Lake Pontchartrain to minister to the Choctaw Indians. He took an Indian name, which gives the poem its title, Shata Ima. This period, by the way, this poem concerns the war. Chataïma on Bayou Lacombe. Oh, Chataïma, so the Choctaws called him. Man like them, speaking of another man come from the great spirit, a long-haired solitary in a desert land, unknown, and then appearing suddenly among his people, shaman, healer, preacher, friend, but executed by the wicked. Shataima was no Indian, though, a white man, Adrien Rouquet, born along Bayou Saint-Jean. Louisiana was no longer French. Rapacious Yankees and new laws, a rival language, mores, even true religion threatened by those heathens, Protestants. The world was too much with him, anyhow. He wanted the new Eden, Christ's own wilderness, purchased by the cross. Young, he ran away with Indians who came by pirogue on Lake Pontchartrain to trade. His, his parents fetched him, schooled him, then dispatched him off to Paris, to Louis Le Grand. He paced the quay along the Seine, bought books, watched whirlwinds toss the brittle chestnut leaves. Back in New Orleans, he paddled to Lacombe, took up with Choctaws, courted Ou Sola, the sweet bird singer, until death espoused her first. Rouquette returned to Paris twice, for law, and then to write, perhaps a family compromise. Who wants a poet for a son? But better verse in France than living among savages. He put his vision, sacred trees, savannas, desert idols, into poems. America's own Lamartine, said Thomas Moore, but saw the underside of Paris too, before he sailed again. He next took holy orders, preached at the cathedral on the sins of cities, Paris and New Orleans, painted women, godless merchants, evil hissing, coiled, and dreamt of bayous dark and still, of winds that brushed the forest like God's hand, and rains, God's tears, to lave the soul. Finally, he settled in Lacombe, wore deerskin, grew a beard, and lived as Shataima, like a Choctaw. By an ancient oak, high boughs for beams and vaulting, branches flying buttresses, 
a tracery of leaves, he sang his mass in plain chant, birds transfixed. Or went along the lake by pirogue from La, Le Bayou Bonfouca to the Chafuncta, carrying the sacrament. The skies turned yellow with a feverish dust, as if for an apocalypse, and then the Federals arrived in gunboats, chasing rebels, terrorizing all. The Choctaws broke their camp and slipped among the bayous to the deeper woods. He followed, taking medicines, provisions, courage, crossing lines at night for more. Their fires banked, the Indians waited for their shepherd, with their shepherd for deliverance. He suffered, fearing sounds of soldiers' voices, torches, the arrest, but he was spared. O oh, Shatayima, can you see from paradise the world and love it still, hear birds, feel needles crackling under moccasins, and think us, children of another era, worthy of inhabiting God's wilderness? And the next poem is called Carolina. It's set in South Carolina, 1875. It is in blank verse, spoken by a woman speaker. Um, she is no longer young. Reference is made to the beginning of the century and the revolts in what is now Haiti, that is Dominica or Saint-Domingue. This too includes the war if I am not mistaken. Sorry, no, it's just another war, just the revolts in Haiti, that's all. This is a true story told to me by a South Carolina man. Carolina. They found us drifting in the sea along the coast. The rations almost gone, the three of us half crazy from the wind and sun, the boat a little leaky, but afloat. From Saint-Domingue, the currents had be, been strong, the weather fair. We had been carried up past Charleston, we were told. I don't recall the journey well, you know. At five, bereft, how much I did not realize then, of both my parents, sailing empty seas with Lou our old Negras, and Georges, my brother. She had learned, it was the years of those revolts of Haitians under Toussaint Louverture, that all the servants and the slaves, herself included, were to rise against the French that week and slaughter everyone. She would not do it to us, children she had nursed and loved and yet she could not speak against her people. She had thought to take us out, a boating party, so she said. She'd heard of islands thick with traveler's palm where birds refreshed themselves in flight. We left the sails like angels' wings. She'd managed to purloin a few supplies, fresh water most of all, some food, some sheets. We lived on coconuts, I think, and sugar toward the last. She may have had some rum. She sang to us at night her Creole lullabies. When we were saved, she told our story in her broken French. The strange thing is, it was some French who found us, Huguenots. And stranger still, my name is Caroline as if somehow by providence my mother had foreseen our odyssey. Now Lou, good woman, lies in Carolina ground. We had, of course, no photographs. My parents' smiles became a phosphorescent sea, translucent, dark, untouchable, 
a ghostly imago receding in the waves. Yet now they seem like children, younger than my own. They walk beneath the palm trees in my dreams and laugh, the trade wind scattering perfume, or sit at sunset holding hands and speak of France and golden journeys. Look, the tide is high, Sargasso shines in jeweled light. At dusk, I listen to the birds that wheel and dive and watch the stars grow powdery and dense. And sometimes think I hear a song, a shout, two shadows calling on a distant shore. Two more. Well, well, well. Ah, here we are. Uh, in in this uh, poem, this is uh, this is called Darby House, Iberia Parish, Louisiana, 1875. Uh, there is mention in here of Francis the First, that is Francois Premier of France, uh, beginning of the 16th century who was taken captive in Italy, northern Italy. When he was taken prisoner and mocked, oh, he, he, he did not flinch. He said nothing at all. When his squire was taken prisoner, he mourned aloud. That's pride. So there's mention of that. All right, in this poem, there's a key fact given in the first stanza. You need to listen very carefully for this key fact. This is spoken by a man who, with his brother and sister, has survived the war. It's, I, I said, it's 1875. So the, the older brother is the speaker. This silence stifles me, a chain, a cell of my design. It stood for punishment, but who has been chastised? For seven years I have not spoken to a soul within this house. We've had no servants since the war, when we lost nearly everything save life, no children, just the centenary oaks, a place half ruined, brother's sister. Worlds ago, we were in Paris, he and I, two Creoles from La Nouvelle Orléans, received in the salons, attending plays by Dumas and Labiche, or the ballet or concerts, strolling on the boulevards and by the Seine, its bridges shining gold like bracelets in the sunset. We were shown the palace of the Tuileries, now turned to cinders by the communard. And Eugène, I even met the emperor at court, and Eugénie, his Spanish jewel. Perhaps it was not right, our fortune built on others laboring, and not by choice. But who can choose his station? Were they not well fed and free to live, if not to leave, while now they are the darlings of the North and free to rot and die in slums. And were those Yankee saints who murdered, robbed, and burnt, the mercenaries of ill-gotten wealth who fought for railroad barons, bankers, thieves, for oil of whales tormented, sailors' lives? When all was gone but Darby, we came back sold off the land, retired to the house to live, I thought, with honor in defeat, like Francois Premier, a prisoner, who mourned to see his squire manacled behind his horse, but mutely turned aside when he was mocked. My brother had in mind another model, Yankee, business deals with carpetbaggers. I refused 
and shall eat dirt if necessary. It is time to write this down. The years are not so young, and Darby too will be a derelict one day, the garden gone to seed, the wind its ghost. So be it. We cannot redeem ourselves, nor change the way the world returns as counterfeit our deeds, iniquity or good. I'll walk out to the gallery. The sky seems lighter now, as if my words of testimony had released a weight or brought an airy promise. If I die before the others, may they know what pride has done for them. We all are relics, but my name is good. I'll hold my peace. By now it is our custom. Yet perhaps I'll smile tonight when lamplight, searching, draws my face out of the darkness and their voices drift and fade to phantom memories in the trees. One more house poem. This is called Live Oak House. Iberville Parish, Louisiana. The date 1825 is an early starting point, but most of the poem concerns a later period. Again, the war is mentioned. The speaker is a woman. Live Oak House. The ancestry, though not Virginian, still was good. The men of upright character as well as property the women strong and known for beauty, but of iron will, believing all in stewardship of land, a decent treatment for the Negroes, law. But Dickinson and Andrew Jackson dueled in 1825, and Jackson killed his adversary. Later, Charles, the son of Dickinson, grown up and married, sold his mansion and estates, left Tennessee, and ventured to the bayous. Would he wish a fortune better than his father? Yes, to live, not die, with honor. Rowing through the flooded area around Grosse Tête in the Atchafalaya Swamp, he found a clump of oaks above the water line and settled there. He built a cabin first. Imagine the young woman, used to cooks and housemaids and fine furniture, at home among the rough-hewn cypress planks, aroused at dawn by coal, cold and stirring coals to life, observing morning on its elbows finally lift its face above the treetops, looking out each evening on the watery wilderness that ties the Mississippi to the west. And yet I think that she did not complain. A woman's pride is to accept her times and husband's fortunes, as she must accept her body, arable desire. Charles drew plans, designed and built the house, live oak, its character delineated well. Two stories with an ample dormered roof, all classic lines in pilasters and doors, full shutters, fluting, function tied to grace. His business prospered. Timber, planting, trade along the bayous east to Baton Rouge and Plaquemine, west with the Acadians. Their happiness of great and little joys was glue for others, children, workers, friends. Then that day came that comes for all. She stayed, began a railroad, worked it through the war and after, kept live oak from pillagers, protected fugitives, and cursed the Yankee thieves who sworn for Lincoln's gain across the South like locusts. Afterwards, the former slaves remained, since they had lived as free men, well by measures of the age. 
her years closed round, their ending weighted as their outlines filled. The house survived her long. A life well thought is texture, ornament, and stable ground. A marbled sea face trimming deeper waves, an architecture of the possible. See how that blossom holds the whole of spring. How birds that score the evening sky can leave intelligible traces in the dark. Thank you.